We spent the last um, part of this chapter looking at the Roman Republic. We are now moving into the Roman Empire. And you're looking at a map of the Roman Empire at its height. Um, and it is during the imperial period that Rome grows to its, um, it, its greatest size. And as you can tell, uh, it stretches over three continents. And, whoops. Um, basically, it's an empire from the border of Scotland, you know, to Baghdad. <laughs> this is a, you know, modern day borders. Uh, it's terrible. So last time we looked at the Roman Republic. Now we're going to be looking at the Roman Imperial period. And it is this it, during this period that Rome reaches its height in terms of its size, in terms of, in terms of its power, influence, uh, wealth, in pretty much every category that a nation or an empire can achieve status, Rome achieves it here. And it's massive. It is a massive place. Uh, it stretches from the British Isles uh, to the border of modern-day Scotland uh, all the way to Baghdad, uh, covering uh, the you know, North Africa and most of modern Western Europe. So this place is huge. And these, this large empire with its large cities, Rome will get up to almost two million people, um, will have other large cities in the hundreds of thousands. They will need buildings, they will need roads, they will need um, aqueducts, they will need uh, everything that large empires need or large urban areas need. Um, to keep the people happy and healthy. And Roman engineers will be more than happy to provide that. Uh, we will see some of the most astounding feats of engineering in the ancient world uh, in the Roman Empire. So around 44, at 44 BCE, um, Julius Caesar, who had declared himself dictator, is murdered and civil war ensues. Eventually, this settles down, and Caesar is declared a god by the Senate. In 31 BCE, Octavian, Caesar's great-grandnephew, or grandnephew, defeats Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, uh, very famously, who um, commits suicide at Actium. And then Egypt is, uh, becomes part of Rome. In 27 BCE, the Senate confirms the title of Augustus for Octavian. Um, Caesar named him his, uh, Octavian his successor. He now becomes the leader of Rome. Uh, he is also considered what is called the princeps, the first among equals. So he is part of the Senate, but he's also better than the Senate. He's, he is the guy in charge. He's also the Pontifex Maximus, the head of the Roman religion. And after Augustus... Um, emperors are chosen by adoption. So sometimes these uh, uh, emperors will choose their children, sometimes they choose political allies, sometimes they choose military commanders who help them achieve military success. It really kind of depends on, on the emperor. And then um, what's, what's really important about Augustus besides um, him being the first emperor, is the massive amount of money that he poured into Rome itself to turn it into this imperial city. He very famously said, I found Rome a city of brick, and I left it a city of marble. Under Augustus, there's going to be huge, um, big civic engineer, civil engineering jobs uh, and projects. And this is going to carry through most of his successors. Most emperors following after um, Augustus want to leave the same sort of legacy that he did and that he established. This is uh, a statue called the Augustus or, uh, of Prima Porta. It is a statue made for the house of Augustus' wife, uh, the Empress Livia uh, at a sort of suburb of Rome called Prima Porta. 
as you can see it was originally painted we don't know exactly what it looked like keep in mind that th this is an artist rendering you see on the right and that you know liberties are being taken we know that there is pigments their pigments have been found in on the statue itself but we don't know exactly uh, what it looked like this is also based more than likely on a bronze original but these kinds of statues were important among Roman rulers uh, because you would have had copies made and you would have had these placed all around the empire you can also see that this image draws heavily from the already established tradition of Roman sculpture that we saw in the Republican period and dating all the way back to the Etruscan influence as we see with this Ale Metelle uh, sculpture uh, of this of this ruler um, so there's uh, the the sculptor of this is very much drawing on established traditions but there's also some new traditions um, being instituted because of the new political uh, position of emperor and the, and the huge paradigm shift that that created. So we see Augustus in a more idealized kind of way than we have seen Roman rulers or any Roman citizens really before this period. Uh, he is young, he is ideal, he is strong, so he has more in common with a classical Greek sculpture than a Roman Republican sculpture in many ways. That verism, that truthfulness has gone. Instead we have an idealized almost godlike image of the Emperor Augustus. Uh, and this, this godhood is reinforced by the inclusion of Cupid. Caesar claimed divine lineage. He claimed that he was descended from the goddess Venus. And Cupid, of course, is Venus's son. So we have Cupid um, over here at the, on the side riding a dolphin. Um, but this is also a buttress. This is meant to support the statue uh, and to help uh, hold it up. Otherwise, this would not be there. We've seen this before, tree trunks and things like that. And that is what this Cupid motif is doing, as well as establishing Augustus's divine lineage. Uh, let's take a closer look. Um, we are going to be looking at his breastplate, what is called the cuirass. Um, it, and this is going to commemorate his victory over the Parthians in 20 BC or 20 BCE uh, and so let's let's take a closer look we can see that this breastplate includes lots of images of gods so here's that idea once again that we've been exploring since the beginning of this course about sort of divine approval um, you know, so this was a Roman victory over an enemy, um, but it was divinely ordained. We see um, the image of the sort of sky god, Kylos, at the top, um, sort of giving his blessing. So uh, to the left, we also see the sun god, Saul, in his chariot. Uh, carrying the sun, and then on the right we see a, a personification of Rome herself, uh, but the Pax Romana, uh, which means the peace of Rome. Um, this is something, the peace of Rome, the Pax Romana, is something um, Augustus established through his military strength and his strong leadership. Um, this led to a, a relatively peaceful time in Roman history because of their strong borders, because of their powerful military, and their conquests of, of, of some enemies who had been giving them a hard time. Um, and so it was, a, it was a time of great peace and prosperity. And this personification celebrates that. In fact, in many ways, these gods are sort of, you know, you have the sky god basically kind of giving his approval uh, um, that all uh, rule underneath the sky is the rule of Rome, is sort of what this is applying. Uh, down the, to the left, we have um, Apollo and Diana, the sun and moon goddess, uh, once again kind of establishing the the Roman rule um, sort of never rests. Morning and night, uh, Rome is all-powerful. 
Uh, and then in the at the bottom we see an image of uh, the Earth goddess Tellus, uh, and so this establishes um, Augustus's uh, earthly rule. So we have both basically, you know, the sun, the moon, the sky, everybody approving this victory, and we see um, a a Roman soldier accepting the Roman standard, the SPQR, the, uh, the Senate and the people of Rome, uh, from the Parthian king. The Parthians had stolen this standard before, and now they are returning it after they were defeated by the Romans. So this is meant to show off uh, Augustus's military victories, it's meant to show off his peaceful rule, and his and sort of the entirety of his rule, the, the, the sort of endlessness in many ways of his rule uh, uh, over this, you know, sort of ordained by the heavens and the earth. This is a portrait of his wife Livia, so we can see that this is once again a kind of idealized portrait. We have moved away from the um, you know, the verism of the Republican period, and we're looking at a, a, an idealized portrait of this woman. The Arapacus Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace, you are looking at a um, monument uh, created by or ordered by Augustus. Uh, this was actually... Uh, uh, ordered by the Senate, I should say, upon his return from a uh, military campaign in uh, what is modern-day Spain and France, Hispania and Gaul. It was located in an area of, of Rome called the Plains of Mars. Um, it was a, and it's an altar. It is a place where sacrifices are made, but it is also meant to celebrate the peace of Rome and to uh, honor the gods for blessing this peace, um, but it is also meant to sort of establish uh, Augustus's role uh, in establishing that peace. It was also made as a, a birthday present uh, for Livia. Uh, it was um, consecrated on, it was, it was revealed on uh, January 30th, uh, of the in the year 9 BCE in celebration of her birthday. So let's take a look at this this piece. It was lost for many many years. It was discovered in the early 20th century um, under um, basically a palace and it was in pieces, it was in parts and it, but it's it's been mostly reassembled but there are some bits and pieces that are still missing. Uh, it is uh, sort of divided into an upper and lower register. Um, so we have this upper register with figurative relief sculpture. Uh, we have this lower register with uh, decorative plant forms. In the middle we have what is known as a meander. Um, this is a form that dates all the way back to um, the Minoan and Mycenaean eras and was used by the Greeks and then uh, was adopted by the Romans in their love of all things Greek. So that Greek stuff will never go away, guys, at all. We'll see, we'll see these, a lot of these Greek patterns in the Christian era and, and into even the Middle Ages. Okay. This was, like I said, it was an altar. Um, it is uh, open air, so the sacrifices could, um, the burnt offerings could, uh, the smoke could rise up to the gods, um, so they could enjoy uh, the sacrifices. And we're seeing sort of reconstruction here on the left of some um, priest bringing offerings. And then on the right you see uh, a plan. It's a rather simple uh, structure, but we we see you know things used that should be familiar with Roman religious architecture, the sort of one staircase leading up to a a, a centrally placed doorway. Uh, we have we have seen this already um, 
in, in, in several Etruscan and Roman temples. There are several images, relief sculptures, carved in a rather high relief, so meaning it protrudes a considerable distance from the surface um, uh, along, the, along the walls, along the frieze. And we're not exactly sure what all of these represent. There's heavy debate among historians, but I'm going to kind of walk you through uh, a, a sort of probable meaning here. Um, we have an image of a goddess, maybe um, a personification of peace, of Pax, or Tellus, and the earth goddess, or maybe even Venus. All of these would be, are, are probable or possible because they all relate one way or another to Augustus. Um, we see on the left and the right personifications of the winds, the east and the west winds. So this is meant to um, sort of represent the expanse of Rome's empire. And they have these rather beautiful um, garments, these togas that are catching the wind and sort of acting like sails. We also see um, the, one of the personifications sitting on a sort of sea serpent, dragon sort of creature, and then another sitting on a, on a bird, on a, on a swan. And this is meant to represent the earth and sky. So this piece of Rome encompasses the earth, encompasses the, the land and the sea. Uh, it is sort of everywhere. Um, this is how great Augustus's piece is. Also, we are looking at his ability to provide whether this is Pox or Tellus or Venus or whoever, this goddess is portrayed in a maternal role. And we see two children, um, probably not directly representations of Rom uh, Romulus and Remus, but certainly alluding to the founders of Rome um, and the idea of twins. But you can see uh, one of them is sort of tugging at the mother's breast, and the other is sitting amongst um, sort of fruits and grains. And in the background, there are plants with fruits sort of growing everywhere. So this is about the uh, about fecundity, the ability to to grow and provide and and, and fertility. This is about um, um, the ability for Augustus. Uh, to provide for his a people. And if you look down below, we see more images of grain, and then we see images of, of cattle. So, once again, these images should appear very, very familiar to you guys by now. Um, this sort of image of largesse, of provision, of, of um, fecundity and fertility, uh, all sort of rolled up in one. This ruler can provide for their people. Another image from the Arapacus is this image of Aeneas, who is a character from uh, Virgil's, I'm sorry, from Homer's Iliad, um, but also seen to be the ancestor of Romulus and Remus, and thus, you know, the founding hero of Rome. Um, a few years after the Arapacus, a a Roman poet named Virgil will write a poem about Aeneas called the Aeneid, and there's allusions basically to Augustus. It is meant to be sort of a, a foundation myth of Rome, but it is also meant to reinforce the power and the divinity of Augustus. So, uh, you know, Augustus very much related his rule and himself to this ancient hero, Aeneas. And we see Aeneas in um, the role of a priest. He has a hood over his head, which was the symbol for Roman priesthood. And remember, Augustus is the head of the Roman religion. And so that is kind of being established here with this forebearer, with this ancestor, if you will, of of Augustus, and he is making a sacrifice to um, 
to the penates, the household gods that Roman worshipped. And this is something I talked about in the last chapter. But it is meant to establish not only his piety and his position as the priest, um, both Aeneas and Augustus, as, 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 as a priest, but also it's meant to show their morality and that this is a, a, um, a ruler who lives by moral rules and laws and that even though he is the ruler of this massive empire, even though he is a descendant of gods, he knows his place and he knows how to keep order and he knows what's important and ethical and moral and so we see him making the sacrifice now there's debate about whether this is Aeneas or not um, everything about the Aeropachus has sort of a question mark over it um, but whether it is or isn't the important thing is that we are seeing this idea of a sort of moral order and the position of Augustus as that sort of leader of the, the, the morality of, of Rome. The uh, north and south sides of the Arapacus are covered with uh, processional friezes, so people walking around in a procession. This is based heavily off of the Parthenon and the Panathenaic frieze, I hope you remember, uh, where we see the citizens of Athens m marching or walking in that parade dedicated to the goddess Athena, but it was also w a way of sort of uh, praising the, the, the citizens of Athens themselves. But that was sort of a generic event, right? It was just sort of, here is uh, this celebration we do every four years, and this is kind of what it looks like. But here we're seeing a very specific event. This is probably um, from the, um, the breaking of the ground ceremony, the consecration of the Arapachus itself, but that, once again, is debatable. Uh, but it is important to see that we are looking at an image, a procession of the Senate, um, so this is still very important under Augustus's rule. Uh, even though he's the first among equals, the Senate is still the representation of the Roman people and have a very strong voice. Rome is nothing without its Senate. It's on their banner, <laughs> right? Um, but we see this image of a priest, uh, possibly Augustus himself, with this hood. So showing the position as both political leader and also spiritual leader. On the other side, uh, we see a similar procession, uh, but we are looking at also images of children. Notice that you'll probably remember in ancient Greek art, it is rare to see children. It's not really until the Hellenistic period where we see the image of Hermes and Dionysus, for example, that we see that we see a child. There were images of children, but they weren't common. But in Rome, we see them everywhere. And we see them kind of behaving like children in this very sort of normal way. They appear kind of fidgety. They're holding on to their father's cloaks, etc., etc. But also, they're pro they might be included here because of Augustus's uh, concern about the low birth rate in Rome. And this is something that will become an issue throughout the Roman Empire. There is once again speculation about what caused this low birth rate. It was lead in pipes, it was nutritional uh, factors, there's all sorts of speculation. Um, I am not an expert, I will not even begin to pretend, I know. Um, but certainly there is, there is an allusion to the importance of children here. Um, and we don't necessarily, you know, we don't see images of children in Greek art hardly at all. The interior of the Arapacus was rather plain. Um, the sculpture, the um, relief sculpture is actually uh, rather different in many ways. It's a lot less high of a relief. It's what we call a low relief or a ba, B-A-S relief. And we see images of laurel wreaths, images of fruits, and uh, other images of uh, 
fertility and fecundity and uh, provision. And we also see cow skulls. So, um, you know, bull sacrifices um, were, you know, bulls were, were some of the animals sacrificed to the gods. And so that was probably the case here. But also, we have this image of the bull skull. We can't get away from it. This symbol of power, the symbol of masculine power uh, we see in ancient Rome and by this point has been established for thousands and thousands of years. This is called the Maison Carrie. It is in Nîmes, France. Uh, uh, it is um, kind of a, a symbol of of the building projects that Augustus created. It is a small temple. It means the square temple. It is uh, a pseudo pereptoral, we call it. Pereptoral, remember, has the colonnade all around. This peristyle, this, this encompassing and closing colonnade. But like other buildings that we have seen, um, Porta Fortunus, um, and Etruscan temples, the columns are engaged, so it's sort of a pseudo, pseudo peripteral. Um, it has the raised platform, um, and then we have the central staircase, like all sort of Roman buildings. Um, but this was a building that was faced um, with with marble, so this is you know something that Augustus, um, you know, one of the things that he is famous for. But it is, it is a very well-preserved temple. Um, and so this was in what was, what was the Romans called Gaul, G-A-U-L, but it today is modern-day uh, France. But also, um, it sort of exhibits the traits of an architectural theorist, a guy named Vitruvius. And Vitruvius is, um, a, a, I think I've mentioned Vitruvius before, but he was this theoretical architect uh, he wrote a lot of books about architecture, and he was a sort of for, uh, function over form sort of guy. Um, he didn't like elaborate decorations. He liked things to look rather austere. He actually found some of the later styles of, of painting that, that we saw in Pompeii. He thought they were too extravagant. Um, they were too whimsical. They weren't serious enough. I'm thinking specifically about the third style with those weird elongated columns that look like something from a Tim Burton movie or something. Um, but his, his ideas are incredibly influential in Roman art, even though they, you know, not everybody necessarily followed him to the letter. His ideas uh, influenced Roman architecture deeply, and we will see his influence over again. Uh, and then later on, or in, in the next semester, if any of you stick around, we will see his influence there, too. The Romans were masters of water. They could make... Um, uh, they, could, they could bring water from very, very, very... Uh, faraway places, I, uh, and they used a system um, called aqueducts, uh, A-Q-U-E-D-U-C-T-S. Uh, aqueducts are basically troughs that use gravity, so they, they are built at a very, very um, low incline, um, but it is, it is enough of an incline that over miles and miles and miles, gravity does its job, and it causes water to flow, and it creates pressure. And, you know, Romans had working toilets, they had working plumbing, they had working uh, fountains, uh, and they were all created through uh, the pressure, uh, uh, gra gravitational uh, pressure. This is the Pont du Gard, this is also in Nîmes. Um, but th this is very similar to many uh, other Roman aqueducts of this period. As we can see, there are arches everywhere. So th this is an arcade, a row of arches. Um, and this allows for this massive structure to exist and to hold the weight of the water. And also this would have been used as a bridge. But these aqueducts were extremely co common, but also... You know, Roman engineers 
um, were able to do things that other civilizations were not. And to bring water and carry water at this sort of distance was absolutely unheard of. But when you have a massive city, you got to provide fresh water. And the Tiber River by this point had become very polluted and very dirty, and it wasn't necessarily suitable for drinking, so they had to tap into mountain springs from further away. Speaking of Roman engineering, this is one of the great feats and marvels of Roman engineering. It's um, known, the Romans knew it as the Flavian Amphitheater. We know it as the Colosseum. So, the last of the Julio-Claudian line, the, the line established by Julius Caesar and carried through Augustus, was a guy named Nero, sort of the mad emperor of Rome, a tyrannical ruler, a ruler who was, was basically um, banned by the Senate uh, and... Uh, after he committed suicide, uh, was you know images were were removed and he was sort of a he wasn't erased from history, but he's sort of the emperor we do not mention, right? Um, he commits suicide. He had built a large palace, and um, the successor emperor, a guy named Ves uh, Vespasian. Flavius tore down that this huge monstrosity of a mansion uh, that Nero built and uh, as sort of a gesture to the people because Nero was this tyrant who terrorized the Roman citizens very often as a gesture to the the people of Rome he builds them a massive sports arena um, and that was known as the Flavian Amphitheater um, both um, Vespasian, Flavius, the son Titus, and Domitian then will follow suit. Um, in fact, uh, the Colosseum was built on, as I said, it was built on the ground of Nero's old palace, and uh, symbolic of this change. But the word Colosseum actually comes from the, uh, the name of, uh, well, the word Colossus. There was a massive, large statue of Nero, uh, that was also on these grounds, and um, this is where we get this name, Col Colosseum, because of its relationship and proximity to this colossal statue. Now, the image you're seeing now is the bones, the skeleton of the Colosseum. It has been picked apart over centuries, and it is just a mere shadow of itself in the Christian era. Um, this was used as basically a warehouse, uh, a supply store for Christian architecture. And so the marble seats and interiors, any bit, bits of metal, um, were uh, columns, all sorts of things were scavenged from the Colosseum to use to build churches. So it is no longer once the great um, architectural edifice that it once was. But let's look at what it looked like back in the day. Uh, it seated 50,000 people. Uh, it was 160 feet tall, so around 16 stories. Um, it was actually finished after Vespasian's death. Um, and when it was unveiled, there were like month-long celebrations and gladiatorial games held in the Colosseum. Uh, it was... Um, a magnificent feat of engineering. As you can see by this picture at the bottom left, uh, it had a covering, a, uh, a covering made of fabric that was operated by a series of pulleys and ropes it, called the velarium. Um, and this was not the first amphitheater to have them. Um, the amphitheater in Pompeii, for instance, had a velarium also, but nothing quite this elaborate. But it did have sort of a large kind of like tent you could put over it. Um, but nothing quite like this amazing retractable system that we see in the Colosseum. The sides of the Colosseum um, are divided into four distinct areas. 
um, the top, which we call the attic, uh, and then the lower three uh, um, areas. The and and this is sort of a, in a way, a kind of um, historical chronology, starting with the uh, the Tuscan column or the Doric, the sort of the the Etruscan version of the Greek Doric column, which is thought to be the sturdiest and was the oldest of the columns. Uh, and then on top of that is the Ionic, and then on top of that, of course, is the Corinthian, and then the Attic sits on top of that. Um, so once again, allusions to Greek architecture are everywhere. While the exterior um, was Tavertine, um, and then there's also some marble areas. Most of the construction of the uh, Colosseum, of course, is concrete. This kind of structure would not have existed in ancient Greece. Amphitheater, remember, means double theater. Now, remember when the Pompeians built their amphitheater, they kind of like piled up dirt around it and kind of dug like this big dirt bowl and then put a... Um, concrete exterior sort of around that but uh, this is completely freestanding um, it is a magnificent feat of Roman engineering um, we can see that the almost the entirety of the structure is made up of barrel vaults um, we are look you are looking at the seats or actually the under <laughs> the area of the seats all of the, the many of these seats would have been marble seats they were uh, subsequently removed in the Christian era so um, so basically what we have is sort of a shell or a skeleton the Colosseum um, held uh, sporting events blood sports gladiatorial battles now, there is debate whether the picture you are looking at right now, whether this is actually accurate or not. Um, whether it is or isn't, I think it's cool enough to show you guys. <laughs> um, the Romans loved to stage mock battles, or, or, or they loved to recreate historical and mythological battles. They would dress up the gladiators in costume. They would recreate scenes from history they would stage like greek battles they would like for example you know stage um you know the battle of marathon or in this case we are seeing the battle of salamis the greek naval battle where the greeks won over the persian army and the colosseum there are there's some who believe some historians who think that the colosseum could have been flooded and turned into an artificial lake and then there would have been naval battles held inside. There are some who argue that this would not have been possible, that it could not have been made, pardon me, been made watertight. Now, certainly the Romans had the ability to control water and to pump enough water in here. They could have definitely done that. Could they have created a massive structure that held 50,000 people and a small artificial lake? I don't know. Um, but it ultimately would not surprise me. But certainly, the floor of the uh, Colosseum is an, is an architectural feat in itself. You are looking at a series of cells and pens and offices underneath the floor of the arena. So... Um, the arena itself would have had a, uh, a floor that would have been covered in sand. In fact, that is what arena means in Latin. Is, is, uh, or the word for uh, sand is arena in Latin. Um, animals could be brought in. Hunts would be performed on the, in the floor of the Colosseum. It was a spectacle. Vespasian um, was a career officer. He rejected extravagance. He is not a guy who's necessarily concerned with portraying himself as a god. 
uh, or wearing the latest fashion or, you know, whatever it is. There's a certain modesty in the way he wanted to be portrayed. And under um, the Flavians, we see a return to that Roman Republican verism. You can see that in this image of Vespasian, the emperor. Uh, he is shown as old with a receding hairline and wrinkles. Uh, on the left is an image of a Flavian woman. Um, we can see uh, her very elaborate hairstyle. Um, the Roman women uh, often wore, you know, styles changed fairly often, and it was important to make sure you caught up. You were caught up with the uh, latest styles, and we see this rather extravagant uh, hairstyle in her, on her. Also during this period, we see new sculptural techniques being introduced into Rome, and one of those is the use of a drill to make marble, to carve marble sculpture, um, as, along with the more traditional chisel. But with a drill, you can create these finer um, sort of um, loops and, and, and holes and, um, that, you can, that are much harder to do with a chisel. And so these kind of more rounded forms are, are um, much easier to create with, with a drill. And we will see this kind of drill work um, th throughout the Roman era and into the Christian era. Uh, triumphal arches. Triumphal arches um, were, you know, not just built for military victories. They could be built for, you know, political victories or um, civic events. Or uh, there's all sorts of uh, various reasons why arches were built. Um, triumphal arch makes us think that they were solely related to the military, but they weren't. That being said, this is a, a um, this is a triumphal arch that celebrates a military victory. Um, this is the Arch of Titus. Um, this shows his sacking of the Temple of Jerusalem. It commemorates his 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 victory over the Jews of Jerusalem and the sacking of their temple. Um, it was built after he died. It was erected by his brother Domitian on the sacred way to the Roman Forum. In the tradition of all Roman emperors, the inscription on the arch, it calls Titus a god. This is pretty typical of a uh, Roman temple, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, a Roman triumphal arch. We have this central arch. Notice the columns placed on either side. This is something we will see a lot in the Roman Imperial period, and actually um, I neglected to point it out on the Colosseum. Um, but this sort of combination of column and arch is, is very common in the Republican period, and ultimately um, not super necessary. Those, those columns aren't necessarily holding up a lot more weight. The arch is doing most of the work. We talked about the importance of the arch, right? Um, the arch distributes we uh, weight in a way that a uh, post lintel system could not, um, but it, it gives a strong appearance to have these columns on either side. And let's take a look inside the arch. If we look up into the interior, we see um, a series of coffers, C-O-F-F-E-R-S, that are the, those are the square-shaped recesses in the ceiling, and we see a rosette, whoops, we see rosette motifs, um, you know, motifs that date all the way back to the ancient Minoan and Mycenaean periods, and in the center we see an eagle carrying Titus up to the heavens. This is called an apotheosis. An apotheosis is a Greek term, and the Greeks believe that the great heroes, but also writers, uh, important people, people who have contributed to society, uh, were apotheosized. They were lifted bodily into the heavens to live alongside the gods. And so we see Titus being taken up into the sky. This is these are this is a um, image representing the spoils of Jerusalem. It's a relief panel from the Arch of Titus, um, and we can see uh, Titus's men carrying away artifacts from the Jewish 
temple. And in the center, you will see uh, the menorah, you know, um, one of the symbols of Judaism. So this was a military victory, and we see this rather large, um, uh, high-relief sculpture on one side. On the other side, we see basically a victory lap. We see Titus's victory parade. Uh, we see Titus in his chariot with a personification of victory by him, and then we see another personification in the far left of um, a personification of a woman representing valor. Notice once again the very, very high relief that we have in this imperial period.